and welcome back to Psychedelics Today, everybody, with your host Kyle Buller and Joe Moore. Today on the show, we get to chat with Dr. Blaj Zengedi and Dr. David Arizzo uh, to chat about this uh, self-blinded microdosing study that's uh, in collaboration with the Imperial College London and the Beckley Foundation. So I guess to give a little bit of background about our guest, Dr. Zaghetti, uh, studied theoretical physics at the Imperial College London, uh, but then turned towards neuroscience in his PhD studies at the University of Edinburgh. Blaj is also the editor of the Dose of Science blog that is published in collaboration with uh, the Drug Reporter website. Dose of Science discusses and critically assesses scientific studies about recreational drugs. Recently, Blaj has started uh, a collaboration with a global drug survey uh, to compare the dose of recreational users of various drugs uh, with the scientific literature, um, a better understanding on how people accurately use drugs uh, provide important context for the interpretation of scientific studies. Uh, Dr. Arizzo, academic clinical lecturer um, over at the Neuropsychopharmacological Unit or psychopharmacology uh, unit, uh, Department of Psychiatry and Division of Brain Science over at the Imperial College of London. <clears throat> Qualified as a medical doctor at the Copenhagen uh, University Medical School in 2001 and currently holds an academic clinical lectureship in psychiatry at the Imperial College London. Alongside his clinical training in medicine and psychiatry, David uh, has been involved in psychopharmacological research using brain imaging techniques techniques such as the PET and MRI. Together with Dr. Uh, David Nutt and Dr. Karhar Harris, he's investigating the neurobiology and therapeutic potential of MDMA and classic psychedelics. So in this episode, we explore the self-blinded microdosing study. Uh, this project is being run by an international group of scientists at the Imperial College London who are experiencing conducting trials with psychedelic substances. Um, and the aim, of this, the aim of this study is to collect data on microdosing, which is really important. Uh, there's a lot of you know, claims out there about the, the benefits of microdosing. And I guess the reality is we don't have too much uh, data on it besides subjective experiences and um, self-reporting, which, you know, it, that's definitely valid. But um, it's awesome that, you know, this, uh, this study is taking place to collect some data to then hopefully, you know, be able to study uh, microdosing in even more depth. Um, I'm just going to read some of these little pieces from their website. Um, the website is selfblinding-microdose.org. Um, so the unique component of this study is uh, what they is what we developed uh, a procedure how to self ex how self experimenters um, can implement a placebo control. We call this a self blinding study design. The self blinding process will allow us to investigate whether microdosers feel benefits due to the placebo effect or because the uh, pharmacological action of the microdose significantly boosting the scientific merit of the study. Uh, you're invited to participate in the study if you use psychedelics and and satisfy the criteria, um, the, their inclusion criteria. This is an important emphasis here. Uh, please take the time to understand the uh, experimental nature of microdosing and the associated risks. Know that psychedelics are still legal in most countries and their possession um, is forbidden by law in most countries. So please consider all the risks involved. The authors decline all responsibilities. And this study is not intended to encourage microdosing. Um, and the study team does not provide any substances, psychedelics, anything like that. The intention of the researchers is to um, rather engage people who are already using psychedelics on their own initiative and to um, make their self-experimentation scientifically meaningful. So if you're already engaging in microdosing and you meet their inclusion criteria, you know, maybe this is will be a cool way to contribute to science. We always get uh, questions on how do I get involved in either research or just the psychedelic field in general. And, you know, if you're already doing this stuff and, um, you know, you want to participate, this might be a great opportunity. Um, it will help 
the scientific community better understand whether microdosing could potentially be a placebo or maybe there's something to it. And, you know, this data that they're going to be collecting can then um, hopefully... you know, fund fund more research. Um, we get a little bit more into why they they developed the self blinding study versus uh, going into a clinical trial um, in in the episode. So, yeah, we'll leave the rest of the info for the episode. We really hope you enjoy this episode. Let us know what you think. Um, and yeah, you can send us an email psychedelics today email at g. Yeah, psychedelics today, email at gmail, um, dot com, And you can leave us some comments, send us over any comments or anything like that. Um, and I guess just some quick reminders. Um, we're about to relaunch uh, our trip and trip and uh, integration workbook. So we just kind of got it reformatted, redone a little bit. Um, so we're going to be getting those up pretty soon, hopefully on our website, hopefully on Amazon Kindle and whatnot. So, you know, keep your eyes and ears out open for that. I'm sure we'll send out an email reminder and also, um, you know, post it on social media once, once those go live. Um, so the trip journal, it's a, a workbook to track part of your trip, um, intention setting. There's little spaces where you can do some artwork. Uh, it's going to be in a PDF so you can download it, print it off. If you just want to print off certain pages, you can go ahead and do that. Um, and then we also have an integration workbook, S- similar thing, kind of working through the integration process, a lot of journaling prompts, um, some dream work, uh, prompts and whatnot. <clears throat> so yeah. Keep your eyes and ears out open for that. They'll be launching pretty soon. Um, And what else has been going on? So I just got back from Breckenridge, Colorado. Got to hang out with Joe for the week, which was really awesome. Got to catch up, do some brainstorming. Um, And we also did some in-person recording, which was cool. Um, We re-recorded our eight common psychedelic mistakes, how to stay safer at psychedelics. Um, So that's something to keep an eye out for as well. We already have it up on Teachable, but we decided to um, redo the recording uh, to get you know better video and whatnot since we were in person and not screen sharing through uh, Skype. <laughs> so um, yeah, look for that. That's going to be really awesome once we get that up on Teachable. Um, if you're interested in checking out any of our courses, we have Navigating Psychedelics, Lessons on Self-Care and Integration, DMTX, and we have some free ones like Spiritual Emergence or Psychosis and the Eight Common Mistakes up on our teachable platform which is our kind of education platform and the website there is psychedelicstoday.teachable.com don't put a www in front of it for some reason it doesn't work um and yeah so if you like the show and like what we're doing here at psychedelics today and you want to support us um You know, there's multiple ways you can do that. Check out our online ed. Um, You could purchase anything like some merch from our store at psychedelicstodayshop.com. Or you could donate to our Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash psychedelics today. And, you know, if you can't purchase anything, make a donation, totally fine. The best way to support us is to share our content, um, share a podcast episode that you like, share it with your friends, family, network. Um, but that's probably the best way to help spread the word about what we're doing here. Um, you could also leave us a review, a review on iTunes or Facebook. Um, that also helps with all the algorithms and stuff nowadays. <laughs> um, but yeah, so thanks so much for listening. And we really hope you enjoy this episode. And yeah, definitely check out this uh, self-blinded microdosing study. Go check out their website. I'm sure the link will be in our show notes. And you can just go click that, watch their video, see what they're up to. This is really exciting. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you on the other side. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome back to Psychedelics Today, everybody. Kyle Buller here with Joe Moore. Um, we're here with Balaj Zagetti and David Arizzo uh, from the Imperial College and uh, the Beckley Foundation. We're here to talk about their uh, self-study microdosing study that they're launching. So yeah, we're really excited. 
Um, there's not too much microdosing stuff happening um, besides stuff that's like going on over the third wave and whatever Paul puts out. So yeah, we're just really excited to learn about what you guys are up to and um, this new study that you're launching. All right, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, do you guys want to give a little background? So maybe we'll start with Balaj. How, uh, you know, who are you and how did you get involved in wanting to research psychedelics? Yeah, sure. Um, so my background is um, originally I studied physics. Um, I'm originally from Hungary, but I did my undergraduate in the UK uh, at Imperial College where I studied uh, theoretical physics. And then I moved up to uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, where I did my PhD in uh, computational neuroscience. And uh, currently I'm working at the research institution in uh, New York, uh, doing sort of like more uh, mainstream genetics research. And my angle into the whole world of uh, psychedelics was um, when I was getting uh, uh, involved with some work through the uh, Global Drug Survey, uh, which is run by Adam Winstock, who is a, a guy at UCL. I'm sure you guys know the Global Drug Survey. And then I started to put together a little research paper about MDMA and uh, and then I actually went to the Open Science Conference in Amsterdam in 2016 and uh, just with, you know, what was an idea of how to do a, an MDMA research. And actually, that's the, the conference where I met David. Uh, I was actually criticizing a little bit his work on my poster, and I know who he was, but I didn't know who, uh, how he looks like. So, you know, there was this dude, you know, walking up to the poster, and I was criticizing his work, and it turned out that he's the first author of one of those papers that I was criticizing. <laughs> But anyway, like actually, then David joined that project, and uh, uh, we, we we did that MDMA research together, and then um, and then and then this project, the South Blinding Microdose project, the idea was born somewhere in like October, November, two thousand sixteen, something like that. And I just uh, had this uh, um, uh, idea that how we could add this the South Blinding process uh, to microdosing. And I knew that I'm not going to be able to do this project completely on my own. So basically, I just made a small write-up, like you know, draft 1.0 of the plan. And I sent it around to a few people I, I knew, including David. And then uh, obviously, it was enthusiastic, and we pushed it together. And, uh, 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 and the study launched 3rd of September uh, this year, 2018. So it's been a while to uh, get everything in order, but uh, here we go. Awesome. Thanks. And how about you, David? Yeah, so um, I, I was the one that Bellis met in Amsterdam who we criticized the study of. Yeah. Um, so, no, so we, we, we collaborated on, 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 on that aspect. Um, but my background is, uh, so I'm a medical doctor and I work in clinical psychiatry and I do research. So for more than 15 years, I've been involved in neuroimaging, um, mainly in addiction and depression, also a little bit in schizophrenia. Um, different kinds of brain imaging um, and currently I have a, a lectureship where I work half-time clinical and half-time as an academic as a researcher at Imperial where I've been for the last 10 years so I, I'm originally I'm from Denmark um, Copenhagen still collaborate with the group there who also do exciting new uh, psilocybin work um, then I was part of my training in, in research was at Columbia University in New York where I did addiction imaging research and then after finishing my PhD where we looked at long-term effects of um, use of MDMA and psychedelics on the brain serotonin system that's what Ballas was criticizing yeah. um, then I went to do postdoc at Imperial where I've then been involved together with David Nord and Robin Card Harris in the studies uh, done there over the last decade in the first line of years you know full dose of primarily psilocybin in healthy with different kinds of imaging and then more lately tr uh, a pilot clinical trial in people with treatment resistant depression and now we are building on onto that and making new trials trials in depression and then we're also exploring other psychedelics full doses uh, DMT and and Robin and and uh, some of the other colleagues also did an LSD study we have done MDMA studies in the lab with imaging and uh, currently, we are yeah doing all this lab-based work with imaging and clinical trials, and then we are on the side doing some some nice online global surveys, different kinds of tapping into the more naturalistic use of psychedelics, where we, you know, prospectively can assess uh, what people 
you know, experience um, when they they uh, have planned a psychedelic experience by their own initiative anyway, then they can sign up a consent online to participate in some of these trials. And here, so there was a logical place to, you know, put in this brilliant idea that Bellis came up with, with the self-blinding, because it, it's also a hands-off study where we are not giving the drugs and we are not meeting the people. It's an online survey where people can be wherever they are and, and basically do what they plan to do. And then um, we can just assess before, around the experience and afterwards um, for full doses, but also for microdosing. So we have a non-blinded microdosing study at the Imperial website and uh, psychedelic survey. And, uh, and then we have added this uh, quite wonderful study with the self-blinding uh, that Bellis uh, has sort of came with the idea. And we have then to get the sort of, um, you know, fine-tuned the protocol and had it approved by Imperial Ethics um, and, and then have it launched, as Bellis mentioned, early September. Yeah, that's awesome. You guys are doing some great work. And I think the psychedelic community definitely needs some more research on microdosing. There's definitely a lot of opinions out there and whether it works or whether it's placebo. Um, so, yeah, I think this is one area that you know, it sounds like this study will tackle whether, you know, it actually works or if it is a placebo. What's the hypothesis for this? What are you guys thinking like the outcome might be? So I think, you know, just before we get into the hypothesis, uh, I would just like to say something in advance, which I think is very important to uh, uh, communicate for us scientists to the larger psychedelic user community that when we talk about psychedelic medicine, like not things are being equal. And by being equal, I mean, what is the level of evidence that is available to uh, justify their treatment? So among everything that we hear uh, of all the studies that are going on with psychedelics, by far, MDMA for PTSD is the most advanced in terms of the most scientific evidence being available uh, to justify the use of MDMA uh, for that particular condition. And then sort of like after that, there is also the, um, there is some evidence building for psilocybin and mushroom for depression, but there is already a very big gap in terms of like the number of studies and the quality of the studies available between MDMA and psilocybin for depression. Like, I would say that right now there is a, a promising evidence in favor of psilocybin, but I, I wouldn't say that it is, uh, 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 you know, sort of scientifically have been proven. We, we need to gather more evidence. So there is already a big step between those two categories. And also, like, even one more further step back is microdosing, where uh, there is literally not quite zero scientific evidence, but very, very little. There is only... If you go to Google Scholar or whatever is your favorite scientific search engine and you put in microdosing, uh, you're going to have a very hard time finding papers. I uh, actually think there are only like four published papers on microdosing and two of them are actually, uh, I just find them on preprint services, so they haven't been through the peer review process. So anyway, I would just like to emphasize that like, you know, there are different categories in terms of the level of evidence being available currently yeah. in psychedelic medicine and microdosing is the very last. There is very, very little on that. Right. Yeah. yeah. But I guess also when Bellis mentioned MDMA, then we, if, if because I, 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 I don't think any of us necessarily would, you know, call MDMA a, a strict um, or classic uh, psychedelic. It's sort of a little bit related and it's a very serotonergic drug like the psychedelics are, but, but it's quite a different kind of drug. But, but if we go into and mention that, then we should maybe also mention that the evidence for ketamine uh, mm. for depression is also relatively solid. So those are the two sort of treatment in this broad category that uh, are furthest. And, and and I would agree with Bellis. Then then next level is sort of psilocybin coming now with the work we do at Imperial, but also the work done um, at Johns Hopkins, at NYU, at, you know, uh, in, in, in Switzerland, and now also different places like Prague and so on. A lot of interesting stuff is coming where the focus is a bit of, of psilocybin, which is a gentle um, and, and, and probably quite suited drop for, for therapy, also because of the duration of the effects is quite suited for therapy, whereas LSD and mescaline and so on are quite long-lasting, a little bit more unpractical to use. Um, so the, that's why I think most people, for, for a lot of reasons, but including those ones, that is why psilocybin is moving quite fast at the moment, and big, large-scale, multi-center trials are now being funded and put in to see and hopefully they will um, confirm some of this very beautifully promising um, data from some of these 
you know, a little bit uncontrolled pilot trials. But some of the Johns Hopkins work with psilocybin is quite solid. That has not been specifically for depression, but more end of life or right. um, cancer, re- cancer related anxiety and depression. But um, yeah, so it looks very promising. And, and I agree with Bellis then, you know, quite uh, far behind that is, is, is microdosing. And one of the questions that I, now I'm taking the questions out of your mouth, but one of the questions could be, why is that? Why is it that microdosing is not that studied? And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. One of them is that it's actually, pra- it sounds very easy because the design of a microdosing study is actually easier than a full dose because it's easier to control and placebo control it and blind it because you don't have this massive psychedelic experience built into it because it's microdosing. However, it's practically and cost-wise not easy because it's a scheduled drug. So you need to do it the same way as a full dose, but you need to do it multiple times in a lab over a long period. And that is quite expensive and difficult to do. You need the same approvals and you need to keep people in the lab for the whole duration of the drug effect, even though it's a microdose. Um, And that means you pull people out of the naturalistic setting and you have to have them come back many, many times. That's practically inconvenient and difficult and expensive to do. So that is one reason. Plus, there's, it's not a, a kind of um, use of a psychedelics that is as well described back in time in history. So it doesn't have the same sort of historical ballast and, and we don't build on as much as we do with the full doses that were sort of uh, explored in the 50s, 60s. Yeah, and then to uh, sort of sort of tickle detour here, but uh, because you asked us about the the hypothesis for this study, so specifically yeah. in, in the self blinding study, what we are trying to assess are really two broad domains or categories, and one of them is whether microdosing is increasing um, mental well being, and we are using uh, various questionnaires to to assess that, and the other big domain that we are also assessing is uh, cognitive functioning. So. People who are participating in our study, they are going to have to uh, fill out questionnaires at various time points in the study. But we also are uh, using a platform called uh, Cambridge Brain Sciences, which is a company that is specializing in building uh, web-based uh, cognitive uh, 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 tests. So it's uh, uh, actually initiated by a guy called Adrian Owens, who is well known for pioneering computerized cognitive testing. And this is basically his spin-off company where they are using uh, various aspects of uh, uh, cognition. And, you know, it's sort of like it's, that's a, 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 we already have some feedback from people participating in the study, and they tend to enjoy that much more because effectively you are playing a little game, you know, online. Uh, I mean, you have to think of like these classic memory games and, and, and similar things where you have to show, uh, keep uh, um, some information in your memory and have to recall that. So, uh, you know, that's what you have to imagine. But the point being is that we try to really make this uh, um, study uh, fun to participate in. Like we, we did not, we, we actually, in one of the first drafts, we had many, many more questionnaires and then we realized that this is going to scare away too many participants and we had to scale back and, and then we reduce some of the domains that we are investigating. Uh, something which I think is also important to say here uh, before we go into the method- methodology of the self-blinding uh, um, study that we are doing is that like this is very even though it has placebo control we 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 wouldn't claim you know that this is like uh, this study is going to bring the final conclusions to the field of microdosing because we are losing out some control on what exact uh, drug people are using and in what quantities because of this whole logic of the cell blinding methodology i would argue it is significantly better than you know, an unblinded study, but sort of like this study is not going to be the, the promised land in terms of the scientific evidence that is going to bring forth. Right. And because of that, we opted for a study design which is exploratory in the sense that we do not have like a, a, a razor sharp uh, hypothesis going in. Rather, we are trying to assess uh, sort of like broader categories uh, and then hopefully those can feed into later studies that are going to be sort of like the proper clinical studies on microdosing. So you know, this is still an exploratory study in nature, uh, but I, I wouldn't. But whatever we find, there needs to be a, 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 a follow-up studies. Yeah. So I, I totally agree with Bellis here, and then and, and so basically, in a way, it sort of positions itself a little bit between a very uncontrolled, naturalistic, online kind of study, a little bit like anecdotes, and then a proper double, you know, randomized, double-blinded clinical trial. It's sitting in its own new 
field right in the middle. Um, so it's lower level quality um, evidence than, than a proper lab-based or very controlled trial where the drugs are being given by the investigators and so on. So you know exactly what you're given and all the conditions are controlled. And then uh, a very exploratory naturalistic where you just ask people and make them fill out the questionnaires, but you you are not having the blinded condition at all. Here, this is an a sort of attempt to squeeze in, in the middle in order to produce some degree of evidence that can produce hypothesis for future studies, exactly as Bell is saying. Right, that makes sense. Yeah, it's quite the subject area because a lot of us are big fans of the history of psychedelia and you know, it, it feels like, what are, what are we doing? I, I know we need better methodology in science, obviously, but it just feels like a repeat. And it, to some degree, you guys have to kind of feel it, except you're doing something new that never existed before. Microdosing wasn't on their radar of science, I don't think, back then. So it's, um, it's always an interesting and complicated conversation, but I'm glad people are doing the work because we need l- greater levels of certainty here um, and replicability. Um, are you, are you working with any, go ahead if you want to comment on that. No, I would, I would say that, um, so you're saying that there is a very rich history of use of psychedelics back in the days, particularly 50s, 60s, right? Um, and there's a relatively rich literature, there are a thousand publications or something like that from, from that period. Um, I would say that obviously the, the methods and the sort of critical questions we ask to, to data and the way of conducting studies and understanding results and so on have developed somewhat. Um, and on top of that, and this is me as a neuroscientist with a, you know interest and, and background in imaging, is that obviously back then we, so even though there is some repetition, absolutely, we're trying to do it more stringently, but we also add quite a lot in right. these other trials. Not the current, because this is not a lab-based trial, but this imaging we can do a lot of different quite interesting imaging techniques we actually can try and understand the brain better not just the uh, neuroscience of psychedelics but the brain as such as and, and consciousness and and also the the conditions uh, better by using these drugs as tools and and also understand the brain mechanisms behind uh, um, uh, illnesses and improvements in illnesses and and try to understand potentially this is what we're going to do in our next trial at Imperial to, to compare what are the differences in the what happens in the brain between normal treatment of depression with the normal pharmaceutical and then um, and then uh, the psychedelic approach. So so as I think we have you know we are you know steps um, out you know further ahead um, to to explore other other interesting aspects of psychedelic science than that simply wasn't possible back in the days. But we are we are basically absolutely standing off broad shoulders of, of a lot of brilliant um, work done back then. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, totally agree. There's a huge amount of richness that will be coming with the um, new technologies and new methodologies. And I, I don't think people understand how big of a leap double blind studies are from the way it was done before. Like how important double blind is, is really underestimated. I think um, in the non-scientific populations. Um, I think you're right. And actually, on that note, I think it, you know, when, when people talk about why, now I'm, I'm going a little bit off topic, but I think it's actually quite interesting uh, for the community, potentially, if they haven't, you know, heard that before, that, you know, it's often um, brought forward that it was political reasons, Vietnam War, War on Brocks, Nixon, uh, uh, Timothy Leary, a lot of things that were very political that were the reason for the downfall of psychedelic science. Um, a really interesting alternative or additional uh, view on what also maybe was part of it comes directly from what you're saying, that when the double-blinded randomized trial was sort of introduced as a gold standard way of, of testing new medicines, that was, I think, mainly introduced for testing of antibiotics. That actually co-happened together with the uh, psychedelic science. So that happened in the early 60s. And that probably was both good and bad. Obviously, it was good for science because it was a very meaningful way of testing new method, uh, new treatments in a, in a critical way. Um, but 
because it came at the same time as the psychedelic science was advancing, if you took that model and applied it directly to psychedelic science, it would be and was very tempting for some to basically take the context, meaning basically the setting away, in order to do it in a very stringent way, similar to what you would do for other treatments like an antibiotic. And that might not be that suited for psychedelics. If you take all that safety, all that setting away to do it in a very, very, very pure, pure, pure scientific way, you lose actually some of the safety. And that probably was also part of what went wrong. Well, there's great examples from the country mm. I'm in, from Denmark, where things actually did go quite wrong, in, in at least in one, one facility, because they tried to, you know, ignore some of the guidelines even back at that time and do it in a very stringent, very scientific way where they ignored the understanding of the psychedelics. Um, so, so it's an interesting thing, this thing about the randomized. It's a highly meaningful way, I also think, to, to evaluate new treatments. But it, it's not super easy to apply that to psychedelic science. It's much easier to microdosing because that is closer to a model of just giving a pharmaceutical on a regular basis for a while that, and that people don't have great subjective experiences from. That's easier to apply to the complete double-blinded um, randomized trial uh, concept, whereas a full dose few experience that's more difficult and that's what we are you know we are trying to do as well as we can now uh, not just in, at imperial but also other sites around the world yeah awesome thanks for that it's a really uh, interesting perspective um and i i really want to ask some questions <laughs> about like maybe what happened or what went wrong maybe we could save it a little bit for later um and maybe kind of go into the study structure of how you guys are setting this up and just like the overview of it yeah, sure. So uh, basically what the, the, the idea of this study is that we wanted people to do microdose, but with the placebo control. And basically what is the trick is that we are asking people to hide their microdoses in non-transparent gel capsules. So these gel capsules, you can buy them online or sort of like in uh, um, natural shops. And you, you know, the, the microdose itself is just a small piece of blotter paper. And then you are hiding the pieces of the blotter paper, the microdose is inside the gel capsules. And then sort of like next to these capsules, you are also preparing placebo capsules, which really are just empty capsules uh, without anything inside. And then there is a specific setup manual that our participants have to follow. So if you go to the website, you can find some information that are related to uh, participation. And then after that, you will find a link to this manual, uh, which, which people have to follow. And it walks through people through this whole uh, uh, setup process. What is it exactly that they need to do? So after they have like, you know, set up their capsules and then one side of them is uh, filled with microdoses, the other are completely empty, then they basically have to package them into envelopes and there's a shuffling process and here I don't want to get lost in the details it's all there in the manual but sort of like the way that it comes out is at the end of it you are going to have four envelopes in front of you and each envelope corresponds to one week of the, the dosing period. In our study people are microdosing for uh, four weeks or at least they take something for four weeks because that's exactly the whole point is, is that they do not know when they are taking what. So they are doing this semi-randomized process where they are having, at the end of it, four envelopes in front of them with four sets of capsules inside them. And they are taking capsules, uh, these capsules, uh, uh, according to a given schedule. And then at the end of every week, what they also do is, is that in each of the envelopes, there is this QR code that they put there during the setup process. And they scan that QR code, which is going to uh, uh, display a four-digit code. And then they tell us that code online, and based on that code, we know when they did what. So, you know, it is, it is a way, you know, we are hiding information with the QR codes such that we can tell exactly when you were uh, on a placebo capsule and when you were in a microdosing capsule, but you do not know it at the time of taking it. Mm. Uh, but if you complete the entire study and if you have completed all of the questionnaires, then actually we, we, we tell you at the, at the end of it. So, you know, obviously you, you shouldn't know it at the time of taking it, but uh, 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 people can find it out if they would like to at the, at the end of the study, we, uh, we feedback that information to our participants. Right. And then so people, I was reading uh, the manual, so peop, you're recommending LSD or 1P LSD, is that correct? Um, so nothing with like mushrooms or plant material, correct? Uh, so not at the moment. So basically right now the study only supports the use of blotter-based psychedelics like LSD or 1P-LSD. Uh, 
And the reason for that is uh, basically if you would put the mushroom material inside the capsules, then what people use with the mushroom microbes is about 0.1 grams. And then based just on the weight of the pills, you can tell apart which capsule is loaded and which one would be empty. So we actually had to modify the protocol to allow mushroom-based, uh, uh, or sorry, plant-based psychedelics, including mushrooms. And uh, we actually submitted that amendment to Imperial and is currently going through the, uh, uh, the approval process. So yes, currently you can only do the study with butterbeet psychedelics, but probably somewhere in the second week of January, we are going to have all of the, the paperwork ready so that we can launch uh, so the next wave of the study that will allow uh, plant-based psychedelics as well. Okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, basically, yeah. the, the issue is this way that I was mentioning, that based on the weight, you can tell them apart. And then what participants will have to do is to fill their placebo capsules with an equal weight of a non-psychoactive substance, so something like uh, soy protein or flour or sugar. Uh, um, but that way, just based on the weight, they will not be able to tell that apart. And, and that's what we want. And that way we can uh, adopt the protocol for uh, plant-based psychedelics as well. Yeah, so, so I just want to, because I paid attention to the way the question was asked, because you, you, you asked whether, so for this study we, we recommend LSD, just to, you know, slightly correct that, that, that uh, because this is a very hands-off study, uh, so this is very important to emphasize that this is a study targeting people or inviting people who, by their own initiative, are planning to do some microdosing with a blotter base. So it's not that we recommend anything, but, but, but we invite people if they want to and if they you know, agree to the consent part of this online trial, that they can then do it. But the reason uh, for it being blotter based until hopefully if we get this approval until now, then we now expand, get the approvals. Um, to do a plant based was, was for, for practical reason that simply was was more uh, simple to 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 develop and launch this idea this design based on blotter based but it's not that we recommend anything it's basically just you know an invitation for the people who happen to be planning that specific kind of microdosing at this point but now we hope to expand it right thanks thanks for correcting my language there <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. It, it, it's mainly for, for you know to to also to you know explain and protect the way we do it because obviously we shouldn't and and I don't do not encourage any use because it is you know illicit drugs in most right. places if not all places. So therefore, of course, the the only way to be able to study use of illicit drugs and it goes for all science um, in in a lot of sort of drugs. It is to be quite hands off off and observe. And this study, I would you know give credit to. To Imperial for actually approving this study because I think it's absolutely completely sound ethically, but it obviously is a little bit step further in the sense that people actually follow a manual, but it's still based on uh, people's own, you know, uh, plan for how they want to plan and do the regime of microdosing that can then be integrated into the study that we then provide the framework for. The study has this structure, right, it's really halfway between a clinical study and halfway between this naturalistic observational study. It's a, it's a mix of both. We are not giving you anything yeah. to do the microdosing. But if you are microdosing, then we are giving you a setup process how you can blind yourself. And that's the yeah. self-blinding process. And, and that is what is our contribution. We are not helping, you know, microdosers to, uh, uh, you know, get no. uh, uh, any of the drugs. Uh, which which uh, seems which seems to be a great disappointment for some people, isn't yeah. that true, Alice? That, that you some people who who like they hear about it and they're like, woohoo, we are going to be sent LSD from Imperial College or something. They, they 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 I think they skip through it a bit too quickly and don't really realize that oh oh it's it's it, that is actually not what we are doing. We're basically just providing a platform to to self blind and then collect data from these kind people who are you know interested and generous enough to share these experiences with us so we can understand uh, microdosing better. But we actually, it's not, you know, it's, it's not in, in, in a way, uh, you know, a, a gift shop where we are sending out drugs to people. Um, and and this this might uh, bring, I, I might, uh, this might be the moment to maybe go into, because now we have explained the design into the limitations of the design, because um, I, I think, I mean, as we say, it's sort of floating between uh, a very hands-off naturalistic study and, and a more um, clinical trial-like study. 
And one of the issues where a lab-based, very controlled study where the drugs would be provided by the investigators, as it is in our studies where we give full doses in our lab and with imaging, there we have full, you know, quite a lot of control over everything. We know exactly what we are giving people and so on. In this trial, we have that Achilles heel that we don't know what if people think they have 100 microgram in a blood cell and then they cut it into eight or whatever they do. And then that's their, that's what they want to microdose with. That ends up at the capsules and, and that's the information we get through the, them filling out online what it is they're using for the microdosing. Um, who knows what's in the the, the blood cell they're using? Um, and also, could could it be that there's more in it? Could it be that there's less in it? Could there be something completely different in it? That that's a that's a, a limitation scientifically for us. And and I think it's worth mentioning. And I think I'm allowed to mention that that we have actually really tried to make a very full-hearted, wholehearted attempt to address that scientifically by collaborating with a great, uh, some great collaborators in Switzerland um, and, and about whether it would be possible that some of these participants could, could send anonymously in the blotters with a code that could then be linked back to the, their own uh, participation in this trial mm. without really making it clear who that person was by name or anything, but sort of link that together and send it off with post and then have it analyzed in the lab that would of course be great scientifically because then we could you know we could then understand what what were they actually using and that would be much better that would bring it much closer to what a lab based study would be but the problem is that these are illicit drugs and sending uh, any of these drugs with mail or encouraged to do that that would be a little bit st a step too far because we we are not encouraging people to use them in these trials, but they're using them anyway. But this would be for us that they should send in that bl uh, blotter or microdose, um, and 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 because that's illegal to do that, and that would be for us in a way we can't ask people to do that, which I is mean. you know unfortunate scientifically, but we don't want to risk a potential to bring anybody in trouble to help us out with our science. So so ethics didn't approve that and I actually fully understand that they couldn't but hey we, 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 we tried to, to to make it possible somehow but but it didn't work out um, but yeah Right. And yeah, that was going to be a question of mine for limitations of knowing the dose or what's on the blotter, how somebody cuts it up. Um, you know, I guess one of the trends in the microdosing is doing vol volumetric dosing um, so you could get somewhat of a more accurate quote unquote dose, you know, depending what's on there. But yeah, so that, that was my question. You know, what if somebody cuts it up, but, it, you know, maybe that little piece didn't have anything, a substance it's, on it. Yeah. And Absolutely. Yeah. So, so we are trying actually to partly, partly address that because let's say that people cut it out like a pie or as some other people might cut it out in, in small squares. And the diffusion of the liquid into a blotter is that completely equally distributed across a blotter so that no matter how you cut it and what corner you are microdosing on a specific day, what does that contain? And, and, and that is something we can actually quite easily, you know, um, study. It will cost some money be, in order to analyze these. Um, but, but that doesn't have to be of any of the participants. We could just get some blotters separately and analyze that. We would be allowed to do that if we get approvals, but that should not be problematic to do. It's just be costly, a little bit costly. Um, and, and so, but yeah, but we can't link it back to the participants in the study. That's the issue. But still this question of whether all the corners of a blotter have exactly the same in it, uh, that could be easily addressed. It doesn't necessarily have to be by us. It could also be by some colleagues, but, but, um, and that would of course be important to put into the paper if somebody has found out about that in the meantime that would be you know potentially a limitation or potentially we could say it's not a problem because it's exactly the same in all parts of the blotter yeah awesome. so i'm going to jump on here and just say a few more words about the limitations so just also to emphasize further for the listeners that in this study people are using their own psychedelics to participate in the study so we are not sending uh, any drugs to anybody and one of the downsides, as David mentioned, of this is there is we are introducing some uncertainty about what is it exactly the drug that they are using and exactly in, in what quantities. Uh, 
there are some uh, 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 psychedelics that are legal in some countries, like 1P LSD, which is in the gray zone in some countries. But so far, it looks like most people are going to use LSD, which is illicit. So it's going to get from the black market. And that is, you know, uh, because of that, there is some uns- there is significant uncertainty, both with respect to the identity of the drug and the exact quantity. But that being said, I think there are like two reasons to that do not sort of like completely counter these arguments, but somehow lessen these concerns. And one of them is, is that if you analyze blotter papers that have been uh, confiscated by the police and what is being sent to drug testing centers all around the world, uh, about 90 to 95 percent of them contain LSD and LSD only. I don't know the exact number from the top of my head, but we have been talking with the energy controller lab in Barcelona that are testing uh, recreational drugs. And the LSD samples that they get from people, uh, they're almost always LSD and LSD only. Not all the time, but more often than not. So in a sense, you know, this study design would work much less well with the drug like ecstasy, which is adulterated very, very frequently. It does happen with LSD as well, but to a much lesser degree. Yeah, that's important. Yeah, and then, you know, sort of like the other side of it. So that is about the uh, uncertainty regarding the exact substance. And as uh, with respect to the uncertainty regarding the exact dose, uh, I think it should be also said that, you know, typically when you have a, a pharmaceutical treatment, uh, like with microdosing, you are expecting some sort of a dose response relationship. So it would be incredibly uh, 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 surprising to find out, you know, somewhere down the line that, let's say, at 50 micrograms of LSD, there are all these really wonderful and great effects on depression and cognition, but there's absolutely nothing at 10 micrograms. No, it is very likely that, you know, there is going to be some sort of a scaling of the effects together with the dosing. And because of that, even though we do not know, you know, the exact dose, but we know the range of the dose, we will be able to say something valid about that dose range, the average of that dose range. So like one thing, you know, which I often, uh, uh, or like one analogy that you can consider is that, you know, let's say that uh, uh, micro drinking, drinking small amounts of alcohol is going to become a, 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 the new sexy thing to do. <laughs> and let's say that you're studying a, a cohort of people who are micro drinking and some of the people had 20 uh, milliliters of beer, the others had 40 milliliters and the third group had 60 milliliters of beer. But you do not know which one had uh, how much beer. If you would get this cohort into the lab and, and, and make some studies on them, you would still be able to arrive at some valid conclusions about the mean effects of micro drinking. Like, you know, it's not that you would be completely blind to the effects of micro drinking. You would be blind uh, to the exact scaling of those relationships, but it's not that you would arrive at uh, uh, false conclusions. And I think the similar logic applies to microdosing. That there is going to be some dose response relationship. And uh, because of that, uh, I almost said that it's not important to know the exactness, but obviously that would be a false statement. But uh, more what I would just like to say is, is that even though we do not know the exact dose of the participants, we will, uh, we will still be able to say whether there is a mean effect as microdosing is practiced today within the dose range uh, uh, that people are uh, yeah. participating with. And then last, I would just like to slip in also into this conversation that um, in the same amendment where we are extending the study to allow uh, plant-based uh, psychedelics, we are also adding support for volumetric dosing, uh, which we just mentioned before. Okay. And you need to slightly modify the setup process, but basically the only difference is is that uh, instead of the capsules, you have to use these plastic vials to hold your contain. From the, from the capsule, you know, the liquid would evaporate and it would get very uh, messy very quickly. And also they can only hold a very, very small volumes. But uh, you can buy these plastic wise from Amazon or eBay for very cheap that can hold about 10 milliliters, which is typically what yeah. people use for the uh, uh, micro yeah. So we're adding support for volumetric dosing. Uh, hopefully it's going to be online in the second. If everything goes smoothly, then it will be online the second. Yeah, weekend. I think it's... It's important here to to put in a disclaimer saying that that ethics the, these this amendment about this plant based and uh, volumetric uh, um, is 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 you know being looked at uh, by ethics in the beginning of January and I don't know when this podcast will uh, come out but that means that we actually we don't know but we, this is the hope that this will be fine and possible to ex 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 expand the survey with these elements um, to sort of be able to 
you know, um, include users with a more wide range of, of microdosing uh, methods. Um, but we don't know. So it, it, if people listen to this and they're like, where was it? Then it probably was because it wasn't approved for one reason or the other. So, so there's this disclaimer. We don't know. It's in the hands of the ethics. I think another aspect that I wanted to touch briefly on is what is a microdose? And I'm just going to, you know, advertise for study uh, a paper that uh, will hopefully come up come out within the next couple of months, um, both with Kim Kuipers and, and David Nutt, and, and I'm also uh, one of the authors in that paper, about what, what is what is microdosing. So there, there will be sort of, you know, some thoughts um, and and uh, data supporting these thoughts about, about microdosing that will hopefully come out within the next months if everything goes right. But this is just a little teaser because it's it's just been submitted, so we don't know. But... Uh, one thing to to bear in mind is the term microdosing. So the term micro psychedelic microdosing is basically a a mic. You know that's a yeah. It's the, the, a psychedelic microdosing basically is not necessarily the same as pharmacological microdosing, which is a bit uh, confusing. Probably some people. Some people really don't care because they're just like microdosing is when they hear that word, it's about psychedelic microdosing. But for people like us coming from, you know, psychopharmacology and, and pharmacology, and then it's actually a little bit confusing term because normally if you speak about a pharmacological microdose, you speak about less than a hundredth of, of, of a dose of a substance that has a, a proper pharmacological effect. Whereas with uh, psychedelic microdosing, it's more like a tenth or twentieth. So it's more like a mini or minor dose than it's a proper micro dose mm. in pharmacological terms. And what the Copenhagen colleagues have recently found actually supports that a lot, that the effect on the serotonin 2A receptor, which is a very important receptor for the action of, of these psychedelics, that it seems that what people use as microdoses actually have a really significant impact on that receptor. It's like more 30-40% of the receptor being stimulated than just a couple of percentage, which is more the the how we look at pharmacological microdoses. Then it should be only be very very few percent of the receptors being being affected by the drug. So so basically, what I'm saying is a microdose is not a microdose. That's basically what I'm saying. That a, a, a psychedelic microdose is not necessarily a pharmacological microdose. That's a bit geeky because who cares? But it's just to <laughs> we do. because yeah, we do. We, do. we, are, we are we are geeky enough to to care a little bit about it. But it's not that we. I want to change the terminology. I mean, that's that's fine. As long as people talk about psychedelic microdosing and not just microdosing as a term that should cover all of it, because that would be a bit confusing. <laughs> I'm kind of curious about um, your responses or theoretical responses to somebody like David Nichols, who kind of, or or Ben Sessa, who kind of thinks microdosing is made up. It's like uh, it's all placebo. Um, mm -hmm. or at all hooey like what do, you, what do you think or how do you usually talk about that so I think uh, there is certainly the possibility that you know microdosing is just a, a, a glorified placebo effect like currently what we know what is in the scientific literature that possibility cannot be ruled out and uh, I think that is important to emphasize you know over and over again that there is very very little research uh, being done on uh, microdosing well, there might be quite a lot, but there's not anything out yet. That if today, you know, you look at the scientific literature, then there is not much available. There is much more in the pipelines, but, you know, yeah. before it's getting published, we don't have access to that. So I'm speaking as of 2018, 21st of December, just to be precise. Um, but anyway, going back, you know, to this whole question of uh, uh, placebo, I think... One uh, aspect of it that is very important to consider is that who are the people who are currently microdosing? And, you know, it's, it's both of the microdosers are not going to be a random selection of people from the street. It is very likely that most people who are microdosing today, they are people who had some prior experiences with uh, recreational doses of uh, uh, psychedelics. Uh, and, and really the point here is that, you know, if you... Currently, microdosing is not an evidence-based treatment, and you have to go out your own way to do microdosing because it is done with an illegal drug. You have to acquire that. So you have to put in some very active and conscious effort in order to do microdosing. 
And it is not unreasonable to assume that people who are willing to put in this effort and are also taking on some of the legal risk, uh, they are doing it because they are thinking that microdosing is good. They are putting this, they're going through the trouble of microdosing because they, they think that at the end of the day, there is something in it for them. These sort of like, you know, uh, your, your preconceptions about an upcoming treatment that is uh, sort of like the perfect storm for a, a strong placebo response. I actually do not really like the term placebo response in the context of this study, because I think it is much more about expectation. And that's also something that's often used in the scientific literature, the, the expectation effects. Yeah. Uh, you are going to experience to some degree what you're expecting to experience very often in these uh, 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 pharmacological treatments. And I think especially because here there is this very strongly self-selected sample with microdosers, this is, this is really a, 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 a primary concern. So, you know, right now, if we go and talk to people in science and in medicine about microdosing, then, you know, one of their first questions is going to be, okay, and where is the double-blinded randomized study? And, you know, there is absolutely nothing. And that's always going to be one of their, their major concerns, you know, the, the lack of placebo control study. So I think, you know, if you want to push microdosing from sort of like its current state where it's this uh, exciting but very anecdotal method of using microdosing into something that is uh, more scientifically established and evidence-based, then adding this placebo control is probably, you know, the, the most important component uh, 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 to add. So, you know, where is this self-blinding study, you know, where it's sort of like the power of it in lies is exactly to solve this problem. Because you're taking these capsules without knowing when it's empty and when it contains a microdose, you achieve what the placebo control is supposed to achieve. As we discussed earlier, there are some other limitations that we introduce with the methodology, but we would argue that it is significantly better than the sort of like the, the open label studies where people are uh, knowingly uh, uh, microdosing. Mm. And also, you know, just talking to, uh, I get a lot of emails from our participants and uh, particularly people who have started to run the launch, like they are about finishing up the study and uh, we get a lot of feedback from them. And, like, you know, something that is uh, a, a reoccurring theme is that you know, people who have been microdosing for a while and then do this study, they are, you know, finding it also much more interesting to do it with the placebo control. Like, you know, it's one thing, you know, to do microdosing and, you know, that it feels exciting. But if you do not know when you are microdosing and when you are taking a placebo that introduces this interesting mind game of you are sort of like paying more attention to yourself because you want to figure out when you're on a placebo and when you are on a microdose. So I think, you know, that's for, for some of our participants, you know, that was uh, uh, just also, you know, good to hear us feedback that, you know, by adding self-blinding, you know, not only the scientific value of the study increases, but at the same time, you know, there is also something that the participants have get out of going through this whole trouble of the self-blinding process. Yeah, and I, I, I agree. And, and the so part of the question was um, also about that some people like Sessa and Nichols, they, they have sort of questioned whether the whole thing could just be placebo. And, and so what we think about that, I, I think, and I, I probably speak for both me and Balash that I think the jury is out. We're pretty neutral. I mean, I think it, it, could, it could be that it has some effects it, it, and it could be that it is placebo. I, I would be, you know, relatively 50-50. I don't really know. And that's part of the reason why I'm curious about the study and doing the study because I, I find it, you know, I'm curious. I'm just good old school curious about it and don't really know. Um, th and then, then you can say that there will be things that are very, very difficult to target in this kind of design. So the online nature of the study that is not in a controlled lab where you, that, that puts some limitations to what you can actually explore. So one of the things, uh, one of the themes that people tend to describe about how they find it stimulating and uh, exciting and beneficial is that some people describe it that they, it stimulates their creativity. And, and uh, creativity is actually relatively hard to measure. Um, I mean, now I'm a medic, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, and, and neither is Balish. Uh, so I guess it's not our core expertise, these ways of actually assessing these things. But creativity is pretty hard to, to, um, to you know, do great uh, measures of, and in particular in this 
off at a hands off online design. So I would say some of the lab based studies that will come and hopefully come and be, we have had one planned in Imperial that have been paused because we are busy with other studies that hopefully we'll do. Um, then, then some of these aspects that are difficult to do in this design uh, can be explored further, um, I would say. Right, but that's another limitation, that it's not that easy to, for instance, test creativity in this design. Yeah, so we, we are basically tied to what we can do online in terms of the testing because of the, the structure of the study. And yeah. we talked about creativity as being uh, something which people very often mention and something which is also like, uh, you know, sort of like in line with people's experiences on the larger uh, macro doses. And we looked at uh, platforms that could do uh, assessment of creativity using online tests, but we didn't find anything that is uh, uh, convincing or, or, or worthy uh, pursuing. But at this point, actually, I should uh, mention is that one of the few studies that are out there and that is uh, already published on microdosing is by uh, a Dutch group, uh, I believe from Leiden, who went to uh, the Dutch Psychedelic Society meetup and they did this sort of like similar hands of study that people who were microdosing on the site, uh, they were going through them tests and specifically what they looked at is exactly creativity. And mm -hmm. in the domain, they find some evidence that uh, um, uh, 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 microdosing uh, can increase that. Bear in mind, this is an open label study, so it is exactly missing that uh, placebo control element that we talked about. Uh, I don't remember what was their sample size, but I think it was somewhere around 30 to 40. So, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's a conclusive study, but that is something for which there is uh, some scientific evidence out there. And so far, it seems to be yeah. uh, consistent with what is reported at the anecdotal yeah. level. So, so, and one thing that we can quite easily measure online is the personality assessment. And and personality, which is typically in psychology, sort of understood uh, as five big traits or domains, um, that have that have been ex explored both by myself in uh, um, studies and and uh, by others. Uh, a great study by John Hopkins' group with Catherine McLean, who published that in 2011, about how this um, one of the personality traits openness in increases after when when drug naive. Uh, psychedelic naive people then go through a psychedelic full dose session that it increases um, measures of openness afterwards, a long time after even, and, and we sort of replicate that um, to some extent in our depression trial at Imperial and there are several lines of evidence now coming with this openness thing being quite interesting um, and being basically um, pushed uh, increased after a psychedelic experience. And openness actually contains and elements of creativity it, it correlates with creativity the the weakness about this personality story is that it's it's still a, a questionnaire so it's it's re, it's based on you answering questions about yourself um which is different from actually testing it in a task and that's what mm -hmm. uh, balance mentioned to me in the, in the early part that the cognitive tests that are different for questionnaires are a bit more exciting not only for people to do but somewhat also for us to look at because it's actually people solving a problem uh, or, or, you know, solving a task rather than just answering questions about how they are and how they feel and how they look at themselves. Um, so, so, uh, but, but openness, it's worth mentioning that openness does correlate with creativity and openness is increased uh, in several studies now after exposure to a psychedelic in full dose. Right. Would you expect that to happen with microdosing or do you think um, some of the openness is tied to some of the transpersonal experiences people have on, on bigger doses? You, you know what? I, I, I don't know. But if you think about it, if, if a lot of what people report anecdotally about microdosing is that they become more creative, then I wouldn't be, you know, rule out that that um, that the openness could be pushed a bit because um, that would kind of make sense if people change so in depth that they become more creative um, then but the thing is is that just during the period where they are microdosing that they feel more creative or is it a sustained effect long time after right. I, mean, I think again again big fat question mark and and but what we can see with the full doses of psychedelics is that that openness is increased way after um, the exposure to that session and I agree with you that it looks like the sort of the nature of the experience um, 
somewhat is related to that. In particular, it was in, in the Johns Hopkins data. It actually wasn't in, in our uh, so much. But um, but yeah, still increased long after the, the experience. Awesome. And do you know how many uh, participants you have engaged in your study right now? Uh, yes, we do know, but we would uh, we, we keep, keep numbers that. internally at this point. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I sorry about so, that. But it's not personal. I, I try to ask. <laughs> but we would like double up. <laughs> we can mention. We would like more people to. I mean, again, we don't encourage anyone to 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 do self uh, to do micro dosing at all. But because we shouldn't and can't. But uh, if people are doing it anyway, hey, we would like more people to sign up and do the study because we yeah, need greater numbers. The, yeah. the more the better. Like you know, one of the the advantages of this study design is that it incorporates the placebo control, but basically doesn't cost a whole lot of money because there is this self-lining process that people are sourcing their own drugs. So, you know, the reason why me and David are excited about doing this study, the self-lining micro study, is not because this is like the best study imaginable that you can do. No, like, you know, if you would have infinite resources, we could come up with much better study designs. That's not the difficult bit. In science, what's often the difficult bit is to do good science with the limited resources that you have. And what we feel is, is that this study is going to be very good value for the money because it is basically costing very, very little. Uh, but on the other hand, it incorporates a placebo control and we are going to be able to have a, a, a very large sample size for a psychedelic study with placebo control. So in the official paperwork, we say that we want to recruit more than 100 people, but actually we are more ambitious than that. But you know, the, the point here is that like, uh, uh, in modern psychedelics research, if you look at uh, sort of the, the papers that came out, let's say after 2000, so which is in this modern er era of uh, double-blinded randomized studies, I'm pretty sure that the largest study was is was the um, study by Roland Griffiths at John Hopkins, which was one of the cancer anxiety, and I think they had uh, 50 participants. And you know, it is yeah. likely that we'll be able to have significantly more than that. Again, there are some additional limitations of our study, and you know, sample size is not the only uh, dimension of the quality of a study, but it is an important one. Mm -hmm. So that's why you know we would uh, yeah. uh, you know like to increase the sample size as much as we can. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and a little correction to what Bertha said that when he said in the modern era since two thousand and these randomized studies, it's actually a lot of them have been open open label um, proof of concept studies um, that are now being built on top of. Uh, so a lot of the studies that have come out in the modern era have been, you know, great. I would say also because we have conducted uh, some of them, <laughs> but 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 they are not necessarily, uh, you know, double blinded randomized. They have been proof of concept to show, is this safe? Is there some degree of efficacy? Uh, can it be done in, 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 in clinical populations? And uh, that has been successful, but still a lot to, to do in terms of the full blown randomized clinical trials where you actually really can talk about proper efficacy. Um, yeah. Right. And I mean, it, it makes sense to maybe do it this way. As you said, it's cheaper to maybe do a full blown clinical study. I mean, just to see if there is some evidence here to, you know, bring in the money to do a much larger study in a clinical setting because of the expenses. So, yeah, it does it's, make it's, sense. It's an order of magnitude cheaper yeah. to like, yeah. Uh, but like you're doing like, you know, let's say like 100 percent, you know, in a clinical setting, then you're easily talking about in the order of like hundred thousands of dollars, maybe even in the millions. Like, you know, that would require very significant financial uh, resources. And yeah. unfortunately, you know, that's very hard to get that sort of money in, in psychedelic science. Uh, our studies basically at the end of the day is going to cost uh, somewhere between five to ten thousand dollars. So significantly less than, yeah. uh, uh, you know, a, a clinical study. And while it doesn't exactly produce the same quality of evidence, but it's very good value for money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we should credit uh, the Beckley Foundation from helping us with this study, um, including helping with some of the finances. And, and so they have been great in, as a co great collaborator in this trial. They are. Uh, ongoing great collaborator in this trial. Um, I, I would mention um, another potential advantage. Uh, you, you Now, Bellis mentioned the financial aspect, but another difference from a very beautifully designed lab-based study where you could measure creativity and so on much more and you could still double-blinded and you have know exactly what dose you're given. One interesting aspect where this, our, you know, more naturalistic online global approach is that an advantage of that, in addition to that it's cheaper and easier, is also that 
we don't take people out of their naturalistic setting. I think that's actually a bit interesting. Um, so, so in a lab base, you would have to have people come in for each dose of the microdose in the morning and then spend all day in the trial because, you know, the half-life of the drug doesn't come shorter just because it's a smaller dose. So they would need to stay in for a long period every day they uh, administered such a drug in a lab-based controlled trial. And that means that they're completely out of their naturalistic, you know, life and, and setting and, and are not just getting on with a life where they could. So I think that this also has that advantage that we're tapping into people's normal life and, and just trying to measure whether it, it, it gives them anything in, in, in their, you know, everyday life by just assessing yeah. it from home. In a way, if you see some effects that they are going to be, uh, you know, more robust compared to a lab-based study because people have been doing that while they were going about their daily situations. And, like, you know, typically in science, you want to control for everything that you can, but then you then you also very narrow it down to what situation the effect that you find applies to. Like here, we are not controlling for that many variables, but then if we find some effects, you know, we can say that there is a mean effect that applies a broader set of situations. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's also the uh, uh, the advantage of this uh, yeah. uh, naturalistic uh, design. Makes me think about how many puzzles or things to keep somebody occupied in a clinical setting you would probably need. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, how do you keep them entertained? Yeah, and it would be boring for people. Yeah. They would just be sitting in there, you know, and without not having much subjective effect. It's not that it's, you know, when they come in for these very, very few sessions of full doses, it's a great, interesting, you know, magical experience they go through and it's just once or twice or something. But but this coming in three times a week, just sitting in a room do, 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 uh, and just have to be there because of that would be the, you know, regulatory, you know, condition of such a study that it would have to be like that would be pretty boring um, for everybody and pretty, you know, also for us, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, it should be done. It's, I'm not talking against it. It, it definitely should be done. But it, it, this this actually has some advantages, I would say. So just one more, uh, for a little bit, I would like to go back to this, uh, you know, whole question of placebos and micro and macro doses. So, you know, one thing that's very important uh, uh, to be aware of when we talk about placebo control is, is that there are some uh, pharmacological interventions when it's very difficult to do uh, placebo control because due to the side effects, you know exactly when you have been given the real drug and when you are taking a sugar pill. And actually, the full dose psychedelics are a very good example of that. Uh, I think most people can very reliably distinguish, let's say, 200 micrograms of LSD versus nothing. Uh, both, you know, to the people being with the patients and the patients themselves, uh, going to have an easy time figure out who was the control and who was the active group. Uh, and you know, that sort of like leads to a, a whole lot of very interesting scientific questions. But like one of the things, you know, is that you know that. In theory, at least, you don't have, you know, with, with the microdoses or, or, you know, that's what most people are claiming, you know, that this is like much more of a subtle experience, you know, that people cannot reliably distinguish. Uh, uh, or sorry, actually, so many people are saying this is something that you can reliably distinguish uh, just from a, a, a sugar pill, that the effects are very distinct and they are very reliable in uh, discriminating those experiences. But, you know, when I'm reading some of these emails that I get from people who have already finished the study and they are already getting their feedback, you know, more often than not, even like seasoned microdosers very often get it wrong. I uh, haven't done any formal analysis on this yet, but reading the feedback of the people, I would say that, you know, most people said that they got it right about 50% of the time, mm. uh, you know, which is far from uh, being certain. And I'm sure that also there is going to be some scaling of the relationships here with uh, uh, so like if you take a, a higher dose, then more often than not, you're going to be able to figure yeah. out when you were in the active drug condition and when you were in the placebo condition. But, you know, the, the point just here is that, like, even though people are very often claiming, you know, that this is something that can be easily distinguished from the placebo, and it is obvious that you are microdosing because you feel so fantastic and you are so creative and you are so smart, Actually, if you add the self blinding, you know, then many people are becoming uh, much more uncertain in their judgment. And indeed, even people who have been engaged in microdosing for a long time get it right about 50% of the time. Again, this is not a formal analysis yet, but uh, this is just based on the uh, um, emails that I have received as feedback so far. Yeah, so of course, if you, if, if it, the full dose studies with a full high dose of a psychedelic if you just have the control condition as nothing um then 
yes, then much more than 50% probably would be able to, to, to say that they got a psychedelic. It, it would be a little bit more confusing, of course, for people who haven't tried it before if they have a very uh, limited effect. But that's another story, I guess. But um, then how do you then, but this is not the topic for a, a microdosing discussion here, but uh, this thing about how to, to basically control the condition with a full dose of psychedelic scientifically, there's a lot of different, you know, approaches to that that are very meaningful, I think. So a, a, a way to get around it could be to sort of give up a bit and say you can't really give another thing that is not a psychedelic that would cheat you. But what you then can do is you can take, give different doses of the same drug and see if there's a, a, um, a effect of the dose that a tiny dose doesn't really give the same at all and a medium dose gives get some of it and so on. So that's a way to get around. Or you can give some others. If people have never tried a psychedelic and you give them something like methylphenidate, you know, a stimulant and that they, they will give them some psychoactive experience um, and that could potentially confuse them. In, in one of our trials with MDMA where we gave a proper dose of MDMA, some people actually got it wrong. They actually thought they had a placebo and other people who had the placebo thought they had MDMA, even a full dose, where it was just a non-active placebo. So people actually can get it get stuff wrong. But if you get a full-blown massive dose of a psychedelic, that is different from a, a non-active placebo for most people. Yeah, and I remember uh, Michael and Annie Mithoff were talking about, like, they were confused a couple times. Um, they thought yeah. somebody had a dose during their study, and it turned out it was placebo. <laughs> yeah, we have had the same in our trial. We only done one MDMA trial at Imperial, but we, we also saw that. Yeah, so I would just like to add here is that, you know, like, the placebo effect is often looked as this um, weak side effect, you know, even by people uh, uh, in the medical field. But you know, placebo effects can be pretty strong, in particular when you're talking about subjective effects, in particular like uh, uh, well-being and uh, creativity. So, like, you know, placebos are likely to be not very effective if you uh, break your leg or something like that. But exactly these mind games are much more effective when you're assessing the subjective outcomes uh, that people are often saying that are the effects of uh, 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 microdosing. So that is also, I think, one additional reason why placebo control is especially important in the context of microdosing, because the outcomes uh, have this highly uh, uh, subjective uh, nature. Mm. And also at this point, I would just like to add is, is that, you know, when uh, we talked a lot about the placebo effect and, you know, uh, and then we also discussed that some people are thinking that microdosing is just a placebo effect, but that, that doesn't mean, you know, that people are really not feeling better. So I think this is a subtle point, but something that is very important to understand that microdosing, uh, I, I completely believe the anecdotal evidence that people who are microdosing currently, they are really feeling better and they are feeling more creative. But what is the real question is that whether they are feeling better and more creative because of the pharmacological action of the microdose itself or because they have these psychological expectations about it. The outcome is the same in both scenarios, but the underlying reason for the improvements is different. Right. And by adding in the self blinding process, this is something that we can um, investigate. Yeah, but I think, I mean, the brain is amazing. And 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 uh, so when, when you, you mentioned, Bellis, this thing about, uh, uh, you know, if you break a leg, actually when it comes to pain, you know, the placebo effect have actually been shown to sort of release opiates in the brain. So, so even so, so, so the brain is pretty yeah. magical. And and, I mean, and so they are, the bone, not the pain. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the yes, yeah, so, so there are responses uh, to placebo that actually are physiological, which is amazing and super interesting. And and you know, but we we don't know enough about these things. And it, you know, that's not what all this is about. What we are doing currently, but it's quite fascinating. So something, you know, which is, uh, you know, often comes out that if you look at depression trials and if you look at the effect of placebos, very often you find improvements. And there is a guy called Irvin Kirsch, who is, uh, I believe, at Harvard at the moment. And he's somewhat of a controversial figure because he's saying is that there is no clinically significant uh, differences in the outcomes when you use antidepressants versus placebos uh, 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 to treat people with uh, depression. Uh, and he, he has done a lot of meta-analysis of depression trials, and he's the guy who is famous for that. He noticed that there is a lot more studies being registered with antidepressants than what you see in the literature, and then he realized that many of them do not ever get published, and uh, not surprisingly, those never get published that do not see any results. Mm -hmm. 
So anyway, this this guy he made some uh, meta analysis of all of these papers, and typically, like the placebo response almost comes out to have um, what we call in statistics a Cohen d of about one, and this Cohen d is basically a measure of an effect size, and and if you have a Cohen d of one, that is a pretty significant effect. Like that is nothing. Uh, that's not a small effect. That is actually a pretty significant one. Again, just underlying, you know that. Uh, um, or, or countering that notion that placebo is just this weak side effect. No, this is something that can be uh, have a very significant impact on the uh, subjective feeling of the uh, people. And then, and then you can argue that, hey, why then bother? I mean, if, if people believe enough and have the expectations and then drive this effect to be, you know, have an effect and be efficient and do the trick for people, who then cares? But I would hear say we do because we are scientists and we do care. We want to find out more and understand it better. But, but uh, we could also take away um, potentially by, you know, if let's say we do amazing big studies not us but you know the the science community and basically show that oh oops it was all placebo then i wonder what will then actually happen to the use of microdose and what people would how people respond to that that's a bit a bit of a weird one isn't it um right. yeah because, because, we often joke with david that we are a little bit you know if, if, if the study shows you know, or you know if our conclusions is that this is a placebo effect that we are going to be the least popular psychedelic scientists very quickly <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. we took a it's real just, risk yeah 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 we're just the, the we're the people who totally destroy the party yeah uh, <laughs> come in and would put the wrong atmosphere in the room and people are like oh get these people out of here but yeah. but i i mean you know it's uh, i think it's valid to 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 look into it and, and investigate it but and uh, i mean so many alternative we could consider this totally as an alternative medicine because there's no evidence as we have talked a long time about now but um but a lot of the other ones you know there are tons of alternative uh, uh, treatments therapies for that people you know seek to in sometimes desperation, you know, if you know if other things don't work and the medic have given it up and nothing that they have tried, you can understand uh, the drive for people absolutely, uh, totally, um, and so people have always seek to non evidence based uh, turn to medicine and still do. But this is a, a funny one because we are actually here properly trying to go into it and, and investigate it, and that also shows, you know, how 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 much. Um, uh, I don't know, you know, optimism there is around it mm. since all this effort is made. Um, but as as we just said, yeah, hey, if it turns out that it really doesn't seem to be doing anything above placebo, then yeah, we will be the party killers, <laughs> and not us, not us, because I think it was it still should be explored in a proper controlled uh, trial. I would say it's not that we should, should you know just conclude anything too firmly based on this trial, but. And the same goes if you find positives, you know, if you find what yeah. sort of like the psychedelic community is expecting us to find, and it also reveal like, uh, I'm sure that both me and David will be always very careful of phrasing this as sort of like uh, uh, a step in the right direction and some evidence, but nothing that will be uh, uh, conclusive. Uh, I think that's important to emphasize. And a little bit just going back to, you know, like what would happen, you know, if, uh, if you were sure that this is a placebo effect, I think something, you know, which is interesting is the parallel with um, homeopathy. Because homeopathy is something which is widely believed to be a placebo effect in the in the scientific community. There are many studies on that in uh, many different contexts, and it's very well established. But nonetheless, homeopathy as an industry is uh, 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 still growing, and I think it's 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 going well. Yeah, there are still yeah. many people yeah. who are very strongly believing it. And mm -hmm. like you know, I think that there's sort of like two medical attitudes towards it. And some people, you know, are looking down on it, you know, that hey, it's not evidence based, it's just a placebo and blah blah blah. But you know, on the other hand, I'm also having the more lenient approach that hey, if it works for you for whatever reason, because just how you are psychologically set up, if it helps you, do it. Like seriously, then do it. Like, you know, from a medical perspective, you know, it doesn't matter if you get better no, because of the but then, then, then wouldn't we? And now I'm I'm going completely off topic. But then I would say, hey, <laughs> if you choose, if you choose between homeo, let's say that let's say that there have been doing amazing studies with microdosing, okay. and we also conclude this is also also complete placebo. If that was the case, then you'd be like, if if somebody should choose between them, I'd say, then why bother with the microdose and then just do homeopathy because you know at least that's essentially. Yeah. Anyway, no, I'm not going to go into that. But people can. <laughs> 
people should do whatever they feel is right for them. Yeah, but, and I think yeah. the whole point is, is that for some people, homeopathy is going to resonate more with their experiences and with their worldview, yeah. and for them it's going to yeah. work better. For another set of people, it's going to be more microdosing that resonates with them more. Yes. Like, you know, it is, there's also this thing that, uh, you know, if you talk to people who are actually doing underground psychedelic psychotherapy, that, you know, often one of the first questions that they have to address is if they want to work with a new patient, is that whether they want to do it with uh, mushroom or LSD. And here again, I'm talking about sort of like the, the underground use, so not of the, the clinical use. But, you know, if you talk to that community, that very often comes up, you know, is that there are people who are, let's say, you know, they are uh, vegetarian, uh, very uh, conscious about the environment. Those people are going to be more uh, uh, having a warmer feeling towards mushroom that also being sort of like a natural product, you know, mm-hmm. for them that is easier to to digest in a psychological manner. On the other hand, you know, there are some people who are more rational, more analytic. Very often for them, like acid is just much more sympathetic because that's something that is easier for them to identify with. So like, you know, even within psychedelic uses, so much is about like expectations and what is already in your mind. And, you know, that's gonna, you know that has some consequences both for microdosing and for the larger uh, uh, macrodosing as well. Right. Yeah, this is a fascinating conversation. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, it kind of gets me thinking like placebo, even just like, what if we do find out all oh, this is placebo? It makes me think like, you know, some of the metaphysical philosophical questions of like the nature of reality and how thoughts or intentions can really shape things, you know, like, I don't know, the placebo effect is, is really fascinating to think about. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I also find it, yeah, but but it's yeah, it's not my field of expertise. The, the yeah. whole, because there's a whole, it's a whole scientific field, um, and it's, it's wonderfully exciting and interesting. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah, what the mind can produce. But um, yeah, we'll see in this in this trial. <laughs> what yeah. <we> find. <laughs> Yeah, and then, you know, just also talking about, like, these preconceptions, and again, I'm going to refer to some of the email feedback that I received from people who have uh, 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 been completing the study, is that, you know, they they very often say something that, uh, you know, microdosing helped me with my depression, and, you know, like, that uh, I was depressed, and then a friend told me about microdosing, and I gave it a try, and then it was very, very helpful, but very often, you know, there is some element, you know, of people having some positive expectations about microdosing, because somebody has recommended it, or, or, or something like that, and, and that is yeah. actually also one of the recurring themes that I get from the participants, as far as what is their motivation, that it helped them, and they want to sort of, like, give back to the science a little bit, by uh, uh, completing the study. Uh, uh, so actually, this <laughs> works in our favor that uh, many people, uh, uh, you know, this is this is their way of uh, feeding back into the research of uh, uh, psychedelics. And uh, yeah, this is something that, you know, they can do without, uh, uh, you know, investing uh, uh, a lot of their time and money and something that is going to push forward on the scientific end of it. Right. And that's a great point. We get a lot of questions on like how to get involved in either research or just how to get involved in the psychedelic, I don't know, quote unquote community or field in general. And yeah, if people are participating, this is a great way to help help research, right? Is if you're already doing something like this, might as well engage in some research and help uh, yeah, get some yeah, good exactly. stats out there. Basically, yeah. you know, what we're asking, you know, for the participants is, is that they have to go through that setup process. Which is like, you know, roughly takes about 40 minutes to do. And, you know, you have to read the manual probably once before. You have to have some, uh, you have to get some household items like envelopes and you have to read the QR code. So, you know, there is a little bit of work that you're going to need to put in, but it's not more than an hour, hour and a half max. And then, you know, in return, you are going to produce data that is scientifically much more meaningful compared to the uh, uh, straight up microdosing. And I think it's also going to be a more interesting experience for uh, people who are planning to microdose because of this element of unknown that they are taking a capsule, but Mm. not knowing when it's a microdose, when it's a placebo. It actually almost forces you to pay more attention to yourself because you are not knowing and everybody is curious you're going to pay much more attention to yourself on those uncertain days compared to when you are just straight up microdosing and you know exactly uh, what is in your body. Mm-hmm. 
I think we're probably hitting time. Um, okay. So uh, I don't know. Do we want to start wrapping up and, uh, you know, give some links out or any last piece of advice? Where yeah, can people sure. find uh, this self microdosing study? And So if you go to, so the study's website is selfblindingmicrodose.org and there is a dash between the self blinding and microdose. But if people just put into Google selfblindingmicrodose.org, then they can find the uh, study's website. Uh, right now that in this podcast we mentioned the support for volumetric dosing and for plan B psychedelic, which, uh, as David emphasized, is in the work. So, uh, you know, at this point in time, we cannot say whether that's going to happen or not. But I'll make sure that uh, on the study's website, we're going to give update here whenever we have it, likely somewhere in the second week of January. So even if it's a, a, a no-go, then I'll uh, uh, leave um, some information here so that people are aware of it. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. And, and then I think it's also... So, so uh, Palace, it's maybe also important to mention that it's also linked on the psychedelic survey uh, homepage because that's where we have the different uh, range of online psychedelic surveys. That is also full doses, ceremonial uh, um, use, and so on. We have some some interesting studies, and soon gonna launch uh, Fimeo one there as well. So, if you go to psychedelicsurvey.com, then you will also find this as one of the five or six uh, online trials that we have through Imperial at the moment. So um, so you can also find it there. Yeah, and then people just go there. It's like this uh, you know, page here on the sign up, and that's going to give them the participant information sheet, which is basically what they need to know. And then at the bottom of that page, they will find the link for the manual uh, which is what they will need to follow in order to uh, yeah. uh, get the uh, to do the, the self binding. And at this point, I think I can mention it that there was a, a user who reached out to me who is making a video of the setup process. So this is somebody who has completed the study and he enjoyed it to the degree that he would like to contribute more. And then he he made a video to how to set up the study to sort of like a. Uh, 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 you know, ease that process a little bit. And the video is not online yet, but uh, I've been told that it is going to be up somewhere in, in early January. So, you know, something goes so that the listeners can be aware of is that there is this manual, but it's very likely there is going to be a video version of it going to YouTube soon. Again, it's not really produced by us, but, uh, 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 but something which I... Uh, uh, like the person who is producing it will send us to check for accuracy. So if it's going to be online, then people can be sure that it is accurate. But if we are not producing it, so I cannot promise it for a hundred percent sure that it's going to be online by a certain time. Awesome. Well, Dr. Zagetti and uh, Dr. Arizzo, thanks so much for your time and uh, yeah, we really appreciate it. It's been a really fascinating conversation to have, and I hope. You know, people end up engaging in your study and, you know, helping out with the research. Much needed. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you very much.